together to celebrate the life of John S. Jarvis and also to look to Jesus that we might find hope and comfort and strength. John was a beloved husband, father, grandfather, or upa, as I've been told, a brother, a teacher, and a friend to me. To say that he will be missed would be a terrible understatement. He lived life to the fullest. He lived what scripture would describe as an abundant life. And his living life to the fullest inspired many to do the same. As we celebrate John's life well lived for all of us here today and many others, we will have a tremendous sense of loss. So there's a big boy in there. But at the same time, even as we grieve the pain of our loss, we can find hope and comfort because of John's strong faith in Jesus. I'm not sure how many times I've heard John say, uh, the last couple of years especially, uh, I've lived a great life. The last time I was with him last week, he pointed his finger at me and told me, I have lived a great life, as if to say, don't feel sorry for me. <laughs> lived a great life, and often followed by the words, I'm ready. He was ready. He had a confident hope, a peace, knowing that his death would not be the end but a new beginning. Knowing that in his death we would all have a tremendous sense of loss, but that he would be receiving the reward of spending all eternity with the God that he loved, with the Jesus who saved him. And for those of us here who are Christians, we find comfort and strength knowing that for John this is not the end, and also that for those of us who trust in Jesus, we get to one day experience a glorious reunion. So my prayer for all of us today is that in the midst of our grief, we receive comfort. The kind of comfort that only God himself can give. In the midst of our sorrow, we find it lined with the confident hope and joy that we can have in Christ. And even in the face of death, we rest in the promise of resurrection because of Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to join me in prayer. God, we are so grateful that you are present with us in these moments. It's because of your presence that we are able to face uh, without any denial or trying to say it doesn't or we can face the pain of loss and grief. It's because that we have your presence with us that we can cry as much as we need to cry. And also the reason that we can laugh at the very same time. So Lord, we pray that as we celebrate John's life that you would help us to Remember and cherish all of the best memories about John. Not only in this day, but in the days ahead. Lord, we, we come to you acknowledging that many are struggling in the pain and struggling with questions in the midst of our grieving. And so we just trust that you are going to be fully present with us, that you're going to give us answers as we need it, that you're going to just give us love and grace and comfort as we need it. But we also come with hearts that are full of gratitude because of how our lives have been blessed for having known John. Lord, we pray uh, that in this time of celebrating God's life and looking to you, that we would experience your very real and personal presence with us. I pray, God, that you would help us to see you, to experience your presence so that we could know that you're a God of love and grace and mercy, a God who is able and willing to walk with us through these days. God, I pray for, for Marky, Sean, and Susie, and Richard, and, and the rest of the family, Lord, for all of John's family and friends gathered here today, 
that we would be unmistakably enveloped by your love and your grace. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to share with you some words of hope and comfort from Scripture. The first is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I, I wanted to share these verses because they seem to capture how John was able to maintain a joyful and grateful, positive outlook throughout his life, and especially these last couple of years. There was something about his way to uh, not focus on the negative, not focus on cancer, not focus on the things that weren't good, but to focus on God's presence, to focus on God's blessings, to focus on his family, focus on Marty sitting in the chair next to him holding hands and singing songs to Jesus together. He, he was able somehow to focus not just on the temporary, but to look ahead to an eternal reward. And so they, these verses, I think, give us a glimpse of how John coped, and I think they also give us the hope of how, in the midst of our grief, we can find comfort and strength and hope. Because the pain of our grief is very real, but it's also temporary. Because of Jesus, we have the hope of a reunion with John, where what is eternal will be rejoicing with John in God's presence. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt them. We never want to pretend that it doesn't. But we can't have that hope. Listen to another passage. These are the words of Jesus as he really offered these promises to his disciples before he knew he would be dying shortly. He says to them, and he says to us, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. My hope is that you can grab a hold of that promise of peace, grounded in the reality of God's presence. Mark, he said to me last week, I don't know how people go through this kind of stuff without Jesus. That's the reality of God's presence that's carried Marky through these last few years and will carry her in the days of him. It is the presence. This promise of, I will be with you, I will come to you, is a promise for all of us to know that God walks with us now and that God is with us for all eternity. Well, when you celebrate the life of a man like John Smith Jardins, it's hard to say everything that should be and could be said. Um, I imagine all of you have stories of how John has impacted your life in significant ways because he was a man who made a difference in the lives of so many people. He didn't live for himself. And I wish we had time to hear all of those stories, and I hope that you will share them with Marky, with the family, with friends that are gathered here today. But we are going to hear from a couple of those lives impacted by John, and Pat Cook's going to come as a friend of John's and share a tribute to him. Yes. 
him, and we will miss him greatly. But more important is the love that he had for Jesus, and that he knew him personally. And God knows John and loves him, and is his heavenly father. DJ is one of God's children, and now he gets to be with his father. As a man, John had many gifts, hobbies, and shared them. Music is one of them. He followed his dreams, had a positive attitude, was humble, thankful, Smile, touched many hearts, and let the world know that God is love. As a husband, he loved and was devoted to his wonderful wife, Martha, his soulmate. He colored his world with love, was joyful, remembered others. Cared, believed, and walked with Jesus. In his family, he loved and cared for his wife, his children, his grandchildren, and his extended family. The thing that I thought was so neat about John, he made a home. He lived life. He remembered others. He cared. It's so touching. And it makes me just so joyful that I can share with you my thoughts about him. He was respectful. And he made a difference. He made a difference. A friend. DJ was a real friend. He was fun, and he was fun to be around. He lent a hand. He was trustworthy. He stood for his beliefs, and he didn't quit. A teacher. He was a perky J.A. pioneer. And he taught, if I remember, about 30 years. And he taught in the Jonathan Alder School District. And he loved his students. He loved them. <laughs> he shared his talents with him, and he had many. And many hobbies. Thank you, John, for living the life you lived. He was understanding, he was patient, he was helpful, forgiving, <laughs> enthusiastic, and extended grace. His life included faith, hope, love, joy, Peace. He made wise choices. He trust and obey God. Trust and obey God. DJ chose life. And God gave him eternal life. John was blessed to be a blessing. He laughed, he listened, he learned, <coughs> he prayed, was a servant, and let his light shine for God. He strived to live and serve his heavenly Father 
to let the world know God is love and to walk with Jesus, with Jesus as his guide. DJ looked to him and followed him by standing on God's promises and letting his light shine to praise God. John was blessed to be a blessing. His life included faith, hope, and peace. He laughed. I can hear him now. He strived to live for the Father. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown away and trampled by me. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Being salt, a seasoning, and light. DJ let his light shine for Christ showing others what Christ is like. John S. Jordan, my friend and buddy, was a special friend, a pleasure to know. He touched my life with joy, and I have memories of him in my heart. I'm grateful for God for allowing our lives to be.
Outside of the times when, we, when he was playing the accordion, I'm not sure I ever saw a smile bigger than when he was watching one of our fiercely contested kickball games on the playground. I reflected on many of these things and more yesterday, but in recalling all the memories and lessons, one thing stuck out I'm not sure I ever thought about before. And it may be, it, it may be it was his greatest lesson. Whatever we were doing, Mr. Jester has encouraged all of us to be involved. For those who couldn't afford musical instruments, he loaned them his. The rich and the poor, the big and the small, the brown and the white, we were all Mr. Jestarden's students. He never tried to hide the fact that he thought we were the best students in the school. He never quit driving home the fact that each of us were special, every single one of us. I have this belief about heaven. When we get there, we discover for the first time in the brilliant detail just how much we impacted the world we left behind. All of the lives we touched, many that were completely unaware of, have come alive in an eternal highlight for you. Today, Mr. Jess is beginning to watch his life story, and maybe for the first time, understanding that by touching the lives of his students, he touched the lives of their children and their children's children. You can be sure his is a well-known highlight for you, but it's a story he deserves to watch from beginning to the never-ending end. I know it will make him smile. He always loves seeing his students do well. Driving to church this morning, my seven-year-old son Elliot asked if there was a reason we didn't have a music hall. Elliot's inherited the love and ear for music taught to me by Mr. Gestures. I turned the music up, and as it played, I couldn't help but believe that as a beautiful as the band must be in heaven, this weekend their music just got a whole lot more heavy. Enjoy your show, Mr. Nestor's. I look forward to catching up the reruns with you one minute. I imagine you could all write something similar. Maybe not as beautiful as this guy did. That was beautiful. But you all have your stories of how John has impacted your life. Pat shared with me just a little bit of what she was going to speak about, and she said she was going to share those verses from Matthew 5, 13 to 16. The minute she said that, I thought of the verses that come right before that. We often call them the Beatitudes in Scripture. It's when Jesus is describing the blessed life. And if ever there was a person who lived a blessed life, I think John Desjardins is a pretty good example. And so, as I, I looked at those verses this week, I just saw so many connections between what Jesus describes and how John chose to live his life. I, I really appreciated when I was sitting with the family this week, Sean at one time described John saying he was not a typical teacher. Um, Raging lunatic was stronger language, but not typical was also good, right? <laughs> And I thought, well, what a beautiful testimony, because what I would say is he wasn't a typical teacher, he wasn't a typical husband, or a typical father. He was atypical in all of the best kinds of ways. He wasn't just a, a good husband or a good, he was incredible. He was amazing. Those are the kinds of words that his family and all of you as his friends would use to describe him. God didn't live a good life. He lived a blessed and incredible life, a life that put on display the goodness and love of grace of God offered in Jesus Christ. So I want to read these verses to you and uh, invite you as you listen to Jesus' words to just think in your mind of how you would connect the dots of Jesus' description of a blessed life. This is not what the world says is blessed. It's what Jesus defines as blessed, and I think it's a lot of why we were all so blessed to be a part of John's life. This is Matthew 5, I'm going to start in verse 3. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It, it would be impossible to draw all of the connections between what Jesus says and how John lived, but I thought I'd at least try to connect a few dots for us to highlight some of those connections. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's, he's saying that the people who don't think more highly of themselves than they ought are blessed. Those who have a, a strong understanding of their desperate need for God's grace are the ones who are blessed. I think one of the most amazing qualities of John, that's already been mentioned several times, was his humility. I was thinking, if I was as talented and gifted as John, I don't know if I'd be as humble. I mean, the guy could play who knows how many instruments. But mark these words, he was one of the best teacher, the best teachers she ever saw in action. Like Keith said, you know, many anointed him as the best teacher ever. He was an incredible father. He could fix anything, although he wouldn't let too many people know that he could fix anything. Uh, he didn't want to let on that he knew everything in, uh, in uh, uh, trivial pursuit, but his kids and grandkids knew that he, he was listening to all the answers. He'd say, I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was this. Just another hint of his humility. He lived, despite all of his many gifts and talents and abilities and passions and accomplishments, he exuded this unmistakable humility. A recognition that what he had wasn't all about him, but a gift from God. What he had wasn't him for him, but even to bless others. And that humility was really at the heart of the blessed life that he lived. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. I don't know about you, I, it took me a long time before I even know what that meant. But here's a good definition of meekness. It's power under control. John was a man of tremendous strength, of character, but also physical strength. But that strength of his was always uh, submitted to his desire to love and serve other people. Sean shared about his huge hands and how strong they were. And how John had a way of grabbing his wrist that could say, I love you, or it's enough to stop that. Power under control. I think it was Susie who made the comment of, she was never afraid. Because she knew no matter what happened, John would always be there for her. And, and that strength, not that he was going to go off on somebody, but this power under control when he was there to serve his family, to serve other people. I think about his uh, practices as a teacher and uh, some of the descriptions of his classroom as uh, organized chaos, uh, the one that was always loud. His kids felt free to laugh and have fun and be themselves, and they could get a little bit rowdy, but in a moment, he could have everything under control again, and they knew it was time to be quiet. Not a yelling temper, but power under control of meekness that put on display uh, this strength of character that he had that was submitted to his desire to serve people, to serve God, to love people well. And I think it's one of the things that so many of you friends and former students and certainly his family have appreciated. Blessed are the merciful and the peacemakers. And one of the things that... Um, just struck me as such an admirable, amazing quality about John was the way that he treated everyone with the same kindness and respect and dignity. I love the way Keith wrote it, you know, that every one of his students knew that they were special. And it didn't matter if you were the, the best behaved student or if you were the rowdiest student. That he was going to show you respect, he was going to care for you, he was going to do whatever he could to bring the best out of you. He, he was quick 
to extend mercy and grace to people and slow to pass judgment. That was true with the students. It was true with his family that his kids knew that they could always tell him anything. It was going to be okay. He was still going to love them. He was still going to be there for them. Because he was going to extend mercy. He was going to extend peace to others. We can go all day. We can't do all of these. But blessed are the pure of heart. You know, Jesus is describing a, a wholehearted desire to know and love and serve God. And John exhibited that purity of heart in the way that he lived in relationship with God and with others. John had an uncommon level of, I wish it wasn't uncommon, but it was an uncommon level of personal integrity. He was always honest. He was willing to say the difficult things. He loved people enough to tell them the truth. If you were getting out of line as a student or as a, a child, he would let you know because he loved you enough. He had that integrity to be able to say that. You know, when I think about purity of heart, I think about a purity to love God and to love others. And I'll just tell you one of the most significant ways that God impacted me is watching the way he loved Mark. And if that was a purity of heart on display for the world to see. I don't know what it was. And I, I'm guessing anybody that knew John Markey well, that watching the way they love one another has inspired you, like it's inspired me, to be a better husband and to be a better father. There's a purity to it, a, a selflessness to it. There was nothing in it that he wanted something in return, but a, a willingness just to lay down his life. To love Marky in such a beautiful and pure way. To inspire all of us who got to watch. To love in that pure kind of way. You know, I was just struck by the little things, you know, when John listened to Marky singing in the bed at night and she would say something like, is, do you mind, is that okay? He said, I'd love to listen to you sing. Or how he prepared breakfast for her every day, even as his illness progressed. And in recent days, she was saying, John, you don't have to do that. And he was saying, I love to fix your breakfast. And he did it really well, too. Oh. Unmatched, right? <laughs> the hottest bagel you ever had, the best eggs you ever had. But he did it because he loved her, and he loved her. To serve her. Purity of heart on display. You know, Pat already shared these verses. We talk about a purity of heart and this love for God. John wasn't the most vocal person always about his faith, but there's um, this problem with living the blessed life that John lived. And, and Pat read the words already that a, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. See, John didn't have to preach on the street corner because John lived it so beautifully. He just couldn't hide his love for God and his love for people. And he probably would not like all of us standing up here talking about him and saying all of these great things about him. But it's not our fault, John. You just lived in a way that couldn't be hidden. Your secret was out on display for everybody. It made a mark on so many. I loved what Susie said earlier in the week. She said, uh, having John as a dad was like uh, being, uh, being a rock star. You know? And she said that everybody in the family kind of laughed and nodded their heads. To say, John Destar was my dad, or I'm part of his family and where he's my husband, was to garner instant respect and affection and admiration. Sometimes even jealousy. People wanted to be his kids. See, he lived a blessed life. What that means is he, he chose to to follow after God with his whole heart, but to live blessed also means that he lived to be a blessing, not for himself, but to be a blessing to others as well. And so as Pat said, that means that many of us, all of us here today certainly saw his good deeds, the way he lived, and we continue to join together in praising his Father in heaven. Because his blessed life, his 
way of blessing others inspires us. It points us to the God that blessed him. And we should say that, that when we say John lived a blessed life, we don't mean that he was perfect, right? No was perfect. There's probably a flaw somewhere in him, right? When we say he lived a blessed life, we mean that, that he was one who chose to love God and people with his whole heart. That his blessed life was not just because he was a good person, it was because he had put his trust in Jesus and he chose to follow in the ways of Jesus. So the ways that we experienced God blessing us through John was not, the, the source was not just John, but the source was Jesus and John. The light of God shining through him. To me, that's one of the most hopeful truths today because as we celebrate John's life, some of us go, Man, I'm not sure I've impacted that many people in the way that he did. But it's not because he was extra or extraordinary. He chose to trust Jesus and to walk in the ways of Jesus. And that means that all of us here today can both be blessed and be a blessing to others. The same way that John was. In your unique way. As we choose to trust Jesus and to walk in the ways of Jesus be blessed, and to be a blessing. Now one of uh, the most commonly quoted passages of scriptures really describes this trusting God and walking in God's ways. And I wanted to share those verses out of the 23rd Psalm with you as we close today. You can feel free, I'm going to read it in the King James book of how you memorized it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, Thou anointest my head with oil, thy cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But we can say with great confidence, surely goodness and mercy follow John as Jarvis all the days of his life. And we can know with confidence find comfort and hope knowing that he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today we celebrate the life of John. We say thank you for showing us how to trust in Jesus, for showing us the ways of Jesus, for living a blessed life that blessed everyone who encountered you. I think the greatest tribute we could give to John as we continue to celebrate his life is to follow the pattern that he modeled so he could find. Trust in God to receive God's blessing but never let it stop there. To be those who would pass that blessing on to others. I want to invite you to pray with me. I'm going to pause right now. I just want to give you a moment just to say a prayer for, for Marky, for the family specifically, for a man who loved with such a pure heart, a love so beautiful, the loss is so great. And I want us not to be spectators, but to join in praying for God's comfort. God, we are so grateful for your presence in this time of celebrating John's life and looking to you to find hope and comfort. Now, we, we are beyond grateful for his life well lived, for the love he gave, the way he served, the way he impacted so many lives. We thank you for this beautiful witness of what a blessed life really is all about. So we thank you for 
His blessed life and the way we've been blessed through Him. And God, on this day, we, we come to You uh, putting our trust in You, needing to receive the blessing of Your comfort and strength and mercy and hope and grace. I pray, God, that You would shower Mark You with that today and in the days ahead. For Sean and Susie and Richard and the rest of the family, the grandchildren, friends and others that have gathered, former students, all of us today, God. We need grace that we can't find anywhere else but you. So shower us with that grace and fill us with hope because of John's faith in you. And we entrust him now to your merciful care, knowing that you have received him as your faithful servant. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As you go today, um, the family was real clear. They didn't want any formal, stuffy greeting line as you're going today. So we're going to give the family a head start getting out. And uh, you're invited. There's some cookies and punch and finger foods uh, just around the corner into this space. So we invite you to join them and visit if you didn't have a chance to do that yet. Uh, and then after they kind of make their way, we just want to invite you to release yourselves. Feel free to visit with one another. Uh, share a funny story about the Raging Lunatic teacher that you had or some way that he made you laugh or when he threw your newspaper up on your porch in the morning. Share some of those memories and uh, just find your way into the next room. And as we go, we're going to play the CD of John and his brother again. And so feel free to tap your toes or sing along as we continue to celebrate John's life. My prayer as you go is that you will go with the blessing of God's presence, His grace and comfort and hope. And go as those who can offer the same blessing to others. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I'll let you guys go.